Hey everyone, Dan Bates, President and CEO of Greater Hamilton Chamber of Commerce, and we are thrilled that you all could join us today. Uh, we'll be doing self-introductions in just a little bit, but I'm really excited about the topic today. Um, you know, I think we're all under a lot of stress, and uh, hopefully we're going to learn a little bit about uh, how to at least be a little bit peaceful, inner peace within ourselves, um, you know, totally being surrounded with all this stress. So today we have uh, Mark Reed and Angela Jeffries. Um, and we are excited. We will get back to them in just a minute, and they're going to do self-introductions and talk about their uh, their topic. So with that being said, you know who I am, you know who our speakers are going to be. Now let's find out who all of you are. Oh, one thing I just want to say before we move on, anybody on Zoom can ask questions of the speakers during the presentation, um, interrupt or raise your hand or whatever. Um, if you're on Facebook Live, type those questions in and Tiffany will repeat those to the speakers so they can answer them for you. So um, in just a minute, we're gonna learn how to manage daily stressors. So with that being said, um, Laura, are you doing self-introductions? Yep, I will do those today. So hi everybody, I'm Laura Merrill, the Greater Hamilton Chamber. So we'll just go around the screen and I'll have everybody introduce themselves. Lisa, would you like to be first? Sure, I'm Lisa Sandlin. My company's name is called EmpowerWorks. Um, it's teaching people how to own their life, health, and wealth through education, design, and financial services. Wonderful. Glad you're here with us today. Thanks. Rhonda? Good morning, everyone. I'm Rhonda Croucher, and I'm with Primary Health Solutions, and we are a nonprofit safety net healthcare provider here in Butler County and beyond. We provide um, medical, dental, vision, and behavioral health care services some of which you're gonna hear more about today from our presenters. And also we're in the districts, the school districts around us with school-based health. Wonderful, glad you could be here, Rhonda. Mike Moore, would you like to be next? Sure, uh, Mike Moore, Habitat for Humanity Restores. Uh, be sure to volunteer, shop, or donate. All right, Nancy. Hi, I'm Nancy O'Neill with the Greater Hamilton Chamber. Uh, Tammy. Tammy Walton, the Greater Hamilton Chamber of Commerce. And Tiffany. And Tiffany Grubb with the Greater Hamilton Chamber. Wonderful. So we're glad y'all could be here today. So um, Mark and Angela, we will let you just take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. We really appreciate it. We uh, appreciate the opportunity to be able to join with you guys this morning uh, for this organic discussion. Uh, about how to manage stress, especially in the era of COVID-19. So I just want to introduce myself, and then Angie's going to introduce herself. Um, I am the Director of Integrated Care at Primary Health Solutions, which means that uh, my focus is uh, incorporating behavioral health services in all of our service lines. As Rhonda mentioned, we're a, a full-service uh, health provider in Butler County and now in Montgomery County, and we provide primary care, dental services, uh, pediatrics, OBGYN services, and behavioral health. And what's unique is that we have behavioral health providers who are embedded uh, with the primary care providers so that when a patient does come into a room and there is an identified need, say depression or anxiety, uh, we're called upon to go into the room and provide an intervention for them. Um, and Angie is one of our, our uh, top behavioral health providers, so I'm glad that she was able to carve some time out to be with us this morning. Um, so I recently graduated from Arizona State University with a doctor of behavioral health, which the focus of the program is this integrated medical model. Um, and I'm a licensed professional counselor in the state of Ohio and a nationally certified counselor as well. And uh, now I'll let Angie introduce herself and with her smile. Uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy her today as well. All right, so um, I'm Angie, um, and like Mark said, I am one of the embedded behavioral health um, practitioners here at Primary Health Solutions. So it has just been an absolute delight to be part of this organization and to um, you just be able to partner with them to provide this kind of integrated health service that I honestly haven't seen in other places where I live. So it's cool that we have this here. Um, I was kind of excited when Mark asked me to do this particular conversation because I actually grew up the daughter of a small businessman. Um, and so lived through a lot of the stressors, um, just seeing how 
difficult it was for him, but also how his entrepreneurial spirit really just resonated and has definitely impacted me even to this day. So yeah, it's a real privilege to be able to share with you today. Great, thank you, Angie. So we're gonna share a PowerPoint presentation just uh, while we go through our organic discussion today. And we really do wanna encourage, it was mentioned earlier, but we do really wanna encourage questions, comments, discussion. We want this to be a, a discussion forum. Uh, we do wanna hear from small business owners as well as members of the chamber on how COVID has specifically impacted small businesses in our community. And uh, I think everyone can identify with the extra stress and anxiety associated with running a business, um, running our own lives, if we're going to be honest, running our families uh, with the stressors that we're experiencing uh, with this COVID-19. So hopefully by the end of this, we'll be able to have some skills that we can all use. Uh, Angie and I are big believers in the skills that we're gonna share. We practice them ourselves. And we found them to be very simple and useful in helping us to manage stress and anxiety um, in everyday life. So let me share my screen. There we go. So we wanna talk about mindfulness. Um, I'm curious, is anybody that's joining with us right now, um, are you familiar with the term mindfulness? And if so, can you kind of share with us what you think of or what your definition of mindfulness is? Well, I'm very familiar with it. Um, it's, it's living in the moment. It's thinking about um, what's going on around. So many people that I have found that just kind of get into their routine and they don't really um, think about anything much during the day. They just go throughout their day. And this is just um, what I like to term just total awareness of mm. what's happening and, and being able to be a deep thinker. That's a great description. Total awareness. I like that. Thanks for sharing, Lisa. Anybody else? I, I would agree. I mean, it's awareness, but it's and it's awareness of what's going on around you and how it may be impacting you. Mm. That's good. And we're going to talk more about that in just a moment, how that, uh, you know, there are some things that we do have control over in our lives, some things that we don't, and it's about being able to focus on the things that we can manage successfully. Anyone else? All right, thanks for sharing. So Angie, do you wanna kind of introduce uh, mindfulness for everyone and, and then we'll go from there? Sure, so um, when Mark and I had first started preparing for this presentation, of course, we did our Google searches like all good people do. Um, and we had found an interesting article in the Hartford that was called How Small Business Owners Can Lower Their Anxiety and Stress. And um, the woman who wrote the article, she has her doctorate and she wrote seven different things you can do to lower stress. And as we're reading through them, mindfulness is directly one of them. It is number two. But as we went through all seven, we realized that five out of the seven were actually based in mindfulness. Um, so we, you know, talk about like meditation is one of them, but we really can't meditate without the skill of mindfulness. So this is something that we very routinely discuss with our clients um, because as Lisa said, it's so much about awareness and just being present in the here and now. And some people are afraid of the idea of mindfulness because it's a real buzzword right now. And I think people think, oh, I have to be spiritual or it's something like that. And it's really not, it's paying attention in the moment. And, um, you know, as Dan pointed out, it is, not only being aware in the moment, but knowing that being aware in the moment lets us know what is out there that's affecting us. So um, yeah, so our definition is uh, awareness without judgment. That's very important because when we're being mindful, it's almost like we're observing our own thoughts. So you may, um, you may have all of these thoughts in your head and they're racing and you're trying to sort them out. And it's very easy to judge yourself and just say, I'm scatterbrained, I'm 
you know, everything's hectic, I'm frantic, but when we're being mindful, we're actually looking at all of those thoughts and not judging them. So it's accepting life as it is, um, being awake to life on our own terms, accepting ourselves as we are, um, which sometimes sounds like, mm, I don't want to accept myself as I am, but the truth is the only way to change is through acceptance. And that's really counterintuitive, but it's a huge piece of mindfulness. Um, accepting other people as they are, and that one's really tough. Um, and living in the here and now, which is, I mean, we can't go back in the past. We can't get to another moment. What we have is the here and now. And so our best bet is to live right in it. So what are some things maybe that you can think of in particular in your own lives or uh, more specifically as small business owners or representing the community of small business owners in the city of Hamilton? Um, what are some things that you think are currently interrupting your ability uh, to be mindful in the moment based on that definition that Angie just shared with us? Well, I'll speak again. Um, I have many, many things going on right now. This is the first time in my life, I'm 61, that I've been completely alone and not in a, in a relationship. So the loneliness that has occurred with COVID and not being able to go out and do my daily activities for months was just overwhelming me. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that I'm self-employed um, and I'm a financial advisor, I'm also a special needs architect, I own rental properties, those really have not been affected through this. Um, they go on as normal, but I am not mm. who I was before. So I'm struggling with staying on task and getting things done that I need to have done. Within the last month, my stepfather who is 95 and my mother who is 91, he fell and broke his hip and he was the driver. He was still driving. So my mom and him were pretty self-sufficient. And in an instant, my mom became 100% dependent on me. Um, so now I'm in the role as a caregiver one more time in my life. But I, I have found that it's been extremely beneficial for me because I now have someone to spend time with. <laughs> so I'm with my mom every minute that I possibly can. And she keeps saying, you don't have to babysit me. And I'm like, you don't understand, mom, you're really babysitting me. <laughs> so it's just the emotions. And I, you know, I've studied this for years and I've been in tune with this, but just the, I'm just overwhelmed. You turn on me and it's, there's just, everything is doom and gloom. And I'm, I'm a positive thinker. You know, I believe what you think about, you bring about. And that's part of my teachings that I do. And it's been, um, even for someone with my level of belief in that, I've really struggled. So I can't imagine what some of the other business owners have gone through. Mm. Thanks for sharing that, Lisa. And, and I think that resonates with a lot of us. Um, you know, and I can identify my, my wife and I are caring for my mother-in-law. She's 78 and has chronic health issues. And so trying to uh, help those that we love um, and at the same time trying to go about our daily lives and taking care of ourselves and the things we need to do uh, is a constant challenge um, for small business owners and for the community at large, I think. How, how do you feel, um, we can get into this later, but the overwhelming, <clears throat> I have never been a fearful person, but the overwhelming fear, it's like taking my mom to the grocery store at 91. Mm -hmm. She really wants to go. Um, so we mask up and everything, but just the fear that, am I exposing her to this? You know, mm -hmm. uh, me coming and going into her house, am I exposing her to this? Um, I'm a recent cancer survivor. My immune system is perfect, but <clears throat> the fear that I see when people look at me and they see me out and they're like, should you be out? Should you be doing this? And I'm like, I choose not to live in fear, but this is, this has been a situation where even as business owners, I mean, you're fearful for opening up. What liabilities are you going to incur by having your business open? And you know, what, what are the ramifications? It's just all the unknowns with this mm -hmm. I think are just so overwhelming. Yeah, I agree. And I think Angie and I talk a lot about this, actually, um, 
not just for this presentation, but it's something that we both believe in. And we've had several conversations about controlling the things that we can control. So, you know, yeah. I think that anxiety that you talked about, we all experience, but I think it's refocusing ourselves on what we can control. And, and like you said, where you do everything that you know to do, you mask up, um, you try to protect yourself, you try to protect your, your mother. Um, and so when we come to that understanding that we can control certain things, but the things that we can't control is having the courage to let those things go and focus on those things that we do have control over, you know, our thoughts, our feelings and behaviors, those kind of things I think are important and help really refocus ourselves and help us to have that foundation that uh, despite what's going on in the external world internally, I'm going to live at peace. Um, Angie, what are your thoughts? So I think Lisa, you hit on the crux kind of spoiler alert um, <laughs> of where this conversation is going because um, you know, as we were looking into mindfulness and getting ready to present it, um, I was looking at different research studies and there is um, actually a program called Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction. So they had done this huge study on mindfulness based stress reduction, it worked really, really well. Um, it's an eight week program. They also had another group that did mindfulness based stress reduction and they added the element of radical acceptance. And when they added the element of radical acceptance, the rate of success and people just feeling an underlying peace and calmness was just, it was exponentially bigger. Um, but it is something that in this society, we have not actually built up. We are not people who tend to radically accept life as it is. We tend to live in fear. And so letting go of that fear is really, really difficult. And, you know, Mark and I, all the time with clients, we'll talk to them, uh, like Mark said, about the things that we can control and what we can't control. And what is so fascinating, and this is with myself as well as anyone I talk to, is what we want to have control of is everything outside of us. And that is the thing we don't have control of. And what we could have control of, we generally choose to ignore because that's ourselves our thoughts, our emotions, our behaviors. Um, and so it's really um, just interesting in the society that we live in and kind of the constructs that we've built up because they're counterintuitive to mindfulness. And as we're looking into research on mindfulness, it's showing great results in just giving people that underlying peace that we are so desperately seeking. Well, Angie, I've been in sales since 1983. And the main mantra of what we discuss at every one of our meetings in talking about our business is there's only two things in life that you have any control over. And that's your attitude, what you think about, and your activity and what you do. And everything else you have to just let go. So like I said, I've been living this since 1983. Um, and I'm still struggling with it. So I can't yeah. imagine what the people that have not had the training that I've had, um, you know, because I get up every day now and I'm looking at it. It's like, what's the adventure today going to throw at me? Because it has been day in and day out one other big thing that has happened in my life. So it's just kind of like I've just kind of made a game out of it because I can't control what life throws at me. I have no say so in it. What I can't is how I think about it and what I do about it. You know, and it's so interesting because just this morning, I follow a lot of mindfulness blogs and positivity posts, trying to keep myself in the game. Um, and I saw one that said, meditation is not learning to control your thoughts. It's learning that your thoughts don't control you. Mm -hmm. And man, this could be a really big rabbit hole. We could talk for hours. But I think in American society, we often don't recognize that we are not our thinking mind. Our thinking mind is a tool that we as beings have. And so often we feel like we're controlled by that thinking mind. But the truth is the, the deepest goal of mindfulness would be for us to understand that it's a tool and that we actually have, you know, it, it doesn't control us. We control it. 
That's Any other the thoughts? Life, right? You have to learn how to change the narrative in your head. You have to learn how to change the self-talk. And that's, that's where I think the, the beginning of everything that I teach is understanding personal responsibility, that you are responsible for your thoughts. You're responsible for your actions. There's nobody else that can do anything about that but you. You, you know, it's really interesting because just as we were starting, I jotted down this thought that I had that so often circumstantially, we don't have control. So things happen to us and we feel like, well, it's not my fault that happened. But the truth is, though it's not our fault, we're still left with the problem. So the problem created by the circumstance is still our responsibility. So that's a really good point. And really that concept, Lisa, that you were talking about, about um, understanding again, what we have control over is really empowering. So when we stop to think about all the things that we don't have control over and we're able to focus on the things that we do have control over, it's very grounding for us and very empowering to let us know that, okay, we can't control COVID. We can't control a lot of the things and circumstances around COVID, but we can control how we respond to them. Um, and I think that's where mindfulness is so powerful um, is that we're able to pay attention to what we're thinking, what we're feeling in the moment and the things that we're experiencing and not, as Angie said, letting the circumstances take control of our thoughts, take control of our lives, but that in fact, we maintain this power by being able to control what, what we're thinking. You know, someone once said, we can't control um, the birds from flying over our head, but we can stop them from building a nest in our hair. And so like thoughts are that way, right? Thoughts just come and they come and they come across our mind. But Lisa, you mentioned it, you know, it's, it's up to us to focus on the things we're going to think about. We don't have to, we don't have to dwell on every thought. Um, we don't have to let those thoughts take residence in our life so that we become so fearful or anxious that we're not able to function in our businesses and make the decisions that we still need to make. And and, and, you know, you gave great examples in your own life of everything that you're dealing with as a business owner, uh, taking care of parents, taking care of yourself, and yet at the same time, understanding that you have the, the power and the ability to control those kind of thoughts, the self-talk that goes into that. Um, and so, you know, I think this is a really interesting, this next point is a very interesting point, and I'm, I'm going to let Angie share that this because I think it's so uh, apropos to what we're talking about right now with the control of thoughts in our lives. So um, in a business setting, if you think about it, the way that we have kind of constructed our modern business models, we're really, really proud if we say things like, I'm keeping my nose to the grindstone, burning both, can you know, both ends of the candle. She goes the extra mile. He's pulling his own weight. All of these things. Um, they're kind of measures of success, measures of, you know, your hard work ethic. Um, and it's not that those things are inherently bad, but it's that we tend to not balance them out. So in a business setting, um, when I'm thinking about mindfulness, it, it's like this to me. Often we will punish ourselves for taking a break. But when we take a break, it might be something like we go to get a cup of coffee. Okay, so if I go to get a cup of coffee and the whole time I'm thinking about, okay, I have this client at 10, I had this client at eight, there's a lot of problems, I need to do this, I have to go to the store at lunchtime to get stuff for my family, and like there's all these things going through my head. Then I get back to my office and I start to work and I think, I don't feel like I took a break at all, but I have the shame of being lazy, like I took a break. So how do I change that? Um, and it's through that mindfulness. If I'm going to take a break and I'm going to go get a cup of coffee, I'm going to very mindfully make that cup of coffee. I'm going to smell that cup of coffee. I'm going to taste that cup of coffee. I'm going to try to stop the thoughts that are intruding my break time. Because the truth is, that's the only way to find some rest so that you're actually rejuvenated to go back and start in again. And you know, especially small business owners, all of the weight is on your shoulders. I get to work for a company where my department is what I worry about, but there are people in administration here who have so much more weight on their shoulders. And, you know, so I'm, I'm lucky in that respect. And as small business owners, you have more of that 
So it's important that you have those moments where you're really giving yourself time to just not dwell on all of the business aspects, but on the moment and your enjoyment of the moment, your experience of the moment. Um, I had written down Thomas Merton, who was a Christian contemplative. He said, the untrained mind is like a crow flying over a wheat field in winter. The crow spies lots of things that sparkle in the field, swoops down to pick them up, only to discover that what's glittering in the field are old pieces of scrap metal, not something delicious to eat or something to use for a nest. (laughs) So without mindfulness and focus, we spend a lot of time chasing after shiny objects that aren't actually fulfilling, that aren't nutritious. Um, And so by giving ourselves these moments of rest, we actually are able then to go back into the work setting and focus on the shiny objects that are worthwhile. Does that resonate with anybody that's joining us this morning? Well, it resonates with me because I believe that if you don't give yourself a break, something in your life will intervene and mm. force you to have that break. Mm. Was Good perspective. My, my uh, stage three cancer diagnosis almost mm-hmm. two um you talk about stopping you dead in your tracks so i i was able to i'm extremely fortunate with the businesses that i have that i have recurring income set up so i can just stop whenever i need to and like with my mother right now i've completely just stopped my my son shared with me cuz he knew that that I was probably getting a little concerned about not showing up at the financial office, which he's in that business with me. I'm not marketing my design business right now. I have been keeping the rental properties up because I like doing that kind of stuff. But he was like, mom, he goes, "Um, you have to stop and realize that by taking care of Nana, you are doing exactly what you are meant to be doing right now. And that's how I looked at my cancer. It was like, I had allowed myself to get so busy and so hung up in life that I had stopped taking care of me. Mm. So now I focus on always when I'm writing down my goals and setting my weekly plan and all the planning that I do for my life is number one is me, is my health and my well being, mm. And I have to stay focused. I've completely changed my lifestyle and the way that I eat and what I do. So I just, I'm, I'm trying to encourage everyone, especially during COVID, um, which I think is a huge wake up call that, you know, this, this is now at the forefront of our minds. I think it should be, and I don't ever hear the media talk about it, but what are we doing to take care of ourselves to prevent this from interfering with our lives? Because if we are healthy enough, it's not going to, it's not going to affect us. Absolutely. That's a great point. And um, Angie and I, oddly enough, we're, talk, we're talking about that this morning because we share this analogy with our patients a lot of times. Um, you know, when you're, when you're on an airplane and you're getting ready to take a trip before you taxi out, the steward or stewardess will get up and show you how to, you know, put the seatbelt on, look for the exit signs. And in case there's a sudden loss in cabin pressure, a mask is going to deploy from above your head make sure you put that mask on yourself first before you help the person next to you. And a lot of times as caregivers, right, we're trying to put that oxygen mask on everybody else around us before we put it on ourselves. And the reality is they've done the research. They know that we're not gonna be able to effectively help the people next to us unless we're taking care of ourselves. So the self-care is a huge component of being well, and especially as small business owners, doing the things that you need to do to take care of yourself first, then you can take care of your business. You can take care of your clients and your customers uh, more effectively. And in the personal lives, we can take care of those around us more effectively if we're first putting the oxygen mask on ourselves. And I think that that's where mindfulness is so helpful. It's, it's another tool. It's another oxygen mask that we can put on ourselves to help us stay focused and stay grounded when everything else might be chaotic around us. I do a whole lecture series on put your oxygen mask on. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. That's great. 
I try to I try to really emphasize it to people. I'm and like the stewardess will say, even if it's your grandma next to you, even if it's a baby, um, because it, it really is so important. And it is another one of those places where it's almost counterintuitive to the constructs that we've built up in society. Yeah. Um, and and it is so true that we can think of ourselves too much and become very selfish people, but that's a whole different ball game than self care. And we've got to start to tease that out and recognize that self-care is just vital. And I think it's part of the reason that this mindfulness component is so important because it starts to teach us, you know, as we are observing our thoughts, not judging them, we start to see how much focus goes out to everything else and how much. So when I say focus, I guess I mean energy goes out to everything else and how little energy we actually are putting back into ourselves and it matters. We run on energy. So we need to put it back into ourselves. Well, um, and I think that for those of us, I've always been, everything that I've ever done is I'm a server. I'm a caregiver. I'm, and it's always been, um, I'm always doing for other people. Mm-hmm. It was a real wake up call to realize that if I am not healthy, I am no good to anyone about yeah. anything services that I do and that I provide. So, and that's both mentally and physically, you have to be there mentally or you can't help anyone else either. Yeah. And, and it really doesn't even matter what tradition you come from that still holds water because, you know, I'll talk to people who say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a devout Christian and I believe I'm supposed to serve others first. And I'll say, well, but do you know the great commission, do you, you know, and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, love your neighbor as yourself. And so often people miss that um, because there's so little we can do if we're not giving love to ourselves first. And we don't even know how to love other people, how to care for other people. So that's such a good point, Lisa, that, you know, we really do have to be giving to ourselves in order to give to others. And it is a huge issue with people that are caregivers. And in small business, oftentimes you are doing something because it fulfills you, but also because you are filling a need that you see in society. And so, um, you know, I, I think that there probably are a lot of people like you who have gotten into this because it's a passion that you have, but it also serves other people. Well, I, I will share something very personal with you. At one point in my life, I went to um, a Christian therapist and he, he visited with me for just a short period of time. And he told me, he said, you have two flashing signs on your forehead. One says guilt and one says duty. Mm-hmm. All about feeling guilty for even thinking about oneself. It's like kind of been this, as you say, this societal construct that, mm-hmm. that we feel guilty if we, if we think of ourselves first and mm-hmm. the duty that I felt to serve others constantly. And it's like, I really, I've never, ever really thought that I felt that way. But when he pointed that out to me, I was like, oh my gosh, I have my entire life. Um, mm-hmm. especially as a woman and as a nurturer and as a mother, I raised four children um, and as a wife coming up in a, in a, in a uh, culture of uh, Appalachian parents, um, my dad was, my mom wasn't, but my mom was almost like my father's servant mm-hmm. and three meals on the table every day. Plus she ran the business. Plus she took care of the kids. She took care of the house. You know, she just, and she's still like that at 91. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it, you come up in this culture that you feel like that's your job that that's mm-hmm. what you're supposed to do. And getting that mind shift to, to change, that it's okay to take care of me first. Yeah. That's and like you said, Lisa, this time of COVID, this is an opportunity. I always am hearing people say, I can't wait till we get back to normal. And I'm kind of going, why do we wanna get back to normal? Mm-hmm. There were some good things, but we need to incorporate these lessons that we're able to learn about self-care, about being mindful. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of change I would like to see become more common than what used to be our normal. 
Well, I think, I think it has forced people to just stop and mm -hmm. slow down and look at the lifestyle that so many families were living. What I love is it forced everybody to eat at home again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah. you might be going and getting carry out, but you're sitting down as a family and having dinner. And there's certain aspects of our culture that due to today's world and the activities that we were all living, you know, I've got a son that has three daughters and it was every night was soccer and this and that. And, and they, they spend more time at home than any family that I know, but, mm -hmm. but they were still very busy. And I think about these families that just never ever had dinner together or never ever sat and talked to one another. And yeah. those are the things about COVID and that, and, and now this, um, the way that our elders have been uh, imprisoned into mm -hmm. the nursing homes and things. And I think about, you know, my stepfather now for three weeks is in Jamestown. We can't stand, we can't interact. We get to and stand outside his window and look at him and talk to him on the phone. And it it is heart crushing to think of the elderly that are in homes like that, that we can't interact with. And so it's things like that, that the lessons out of this about honoring our elderly and appreciating them and understanding their wisdom that we need to spend time with them whenever we can. Absolutely. And you know, you mentioned something about eating together as a family, even, even eating on purpose and mindfulness is important. Uh, so many times we rush through our day, we grab a meal or a snack and we're not even slowing down to enjoy it. Uh, so there is this thing focus now on mindful eating, you know, where we take the time to really taste what we're eating, to enjoy the flavors, uh, to take a breath while we're eating, and to be very mindful in the moment and, and what's going on. And that's important uh, in everyday life, and especially as small business owners. I, I like this quote by Alan Watts that's on your screen right now. I like the way he says this, to go out of your mind once a day is tremendously important, because by going out of your mind, you come to your senses. So it's this it's this concept again of taking some time without guilt, without shame, to be able to just stop, uh, whether that's 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes out of your day, to really get outside of your mind and everything that's going on and just be aware in the moment of where you're at. Focusing on your breathing, and we'll talk about that here in just a, a moment, but he, then he goes on to say, if you stay in your mind all the time, you're over-rational. In other words, you're like a very rigid fridge, which because it has no give, no craziness in it, it's going to be blown down by the first hurricane, which leads into this concept of what we talked about earlier. Angie uh, alluded to it just at the beginning of our um, time together today, and that's this idea and concept of total radical acceptance. So radical acceptance means uh, to be committed all the way, complete and total. And so radical acceptance is this idea of, okay, um, the struggles of life are real. And a lot of times in Western culture, myself included, uh, we try to get out of these places of discomfort um, and what we sometimes would consider suffering rather than accepting, again, the fact that suffering is a part of life. Um, and if we try to resist that all the time, we're going to be even more frustrated and more in our head on trying to get out of the suffering. Whereas when we accept the fact that, okay, I'm in this moment, I'm dealing with COVID-19, uh, as small business owners, you know, we had to shut our doors for a while. And, and then we're worrying about our finances and being able to sustain our small business. Um, so how do we deal with that? And one of the first ways that we can deal with that is we accept what is, it is what it is. There's nobody that can change that. But how do we now ground ourselves and help ourselves stay focused so that we can manage our way through this pandemic? Angie? So whenever I start talking about radical acceptance to people, <laughs> um, I first of all try to frame it like this. Um, it's hard. It is not what we're conditioned to do. And it it seems so counterintuitive. But these little bullet points that we've put up here are just good points to why. Why would we 
you know, accept pain and suffering. Um, and partly because if we reject it, it's not going to change it. We have to accept things before change happens, which once again, sounds counterintuitive, but it's, it's just the way that it is. Um, I have seen it happen in the lives of clients where they have come to me and they have wanted something so desperately and it has taken to the point where they finally kind of give up and say, you know what, it is what it is. I'm not going to have what I want. And then it happens. Um, And pain can't be avoided. You know, when I looked at this point, it said it's nature's way of signaling something is wrong. And I started thinking about that. And that can be true. Um, If we get a fever, we need to pay attention because we probably have an infection. But pain does something else too. Pain lets us know we're changing and we're growing. Um, And I was thinking about like, if you go to the gym and start working out, which I probably should do, (laughs) but you know, within that first week, you're going to experience a lot of pain and you accept the fact that you're experiencing pain because what you understand is the change that you want is happening. So that's a really good example of kind of reality acceptance and understanding that, yeah, it's painful, but it does bring about change. And the fact is, if we reject reality, then not only do we have pain, but we suffer because there's an inability to let go. When you really fully embrace something, you just can more easily let it go because you've accepted it. Um, So, you know, that goes on to keeping us stuck in unhappiness, bitterness, anger, sadness. Um, And even though it does lead us to sadness, what most people find is there's a deep sense of peace that is an undercurrent to acceptance. These are not things that happen overnight and that's what makes it really difficult. Um, But it's really important to start touching on it with people because there are a lot of good resources to look into reality acceptance. Um, Tara Brock is a Buddhist teacher and she has written a couple of books on radical radical acceptance and radical self-acceptance. And those are important resources to look into so, um, yeah, it, it can be tough, but it really is worthwhile. So what Angie and I thought might be good is for us to just maybe walk through a couple of mindfulness activities together, all of us, um, while we are together. Um, and I'm going to join with you and um, kind of be the quote unquote patient as Angie walks us through these uh, brief mindfulness skills that we can, that don't take much time out of our day, but yet are so powerful in helping us to stay grounded. So I first want to reiterate what Mark was saying about mindful eating, because that's one of the simplest places we can start is with anything that has to do with our five senses to do it mindfully. So like I said, when you're making a cup of coffee to really smell the coffee, taste the coffee, be in that moment. Don't let other things distract you. You know, part of the thing for all of us is that there was research coming out in the 90s that talked about multitasking. And we started to really glorify multitasking. And now we're doing research and finding out multitasking is not even really a thing. The human brain has a switch and some brains can switch faster than others but they really never multitask. So we are putting ourselves in an unnatural position when we try to multitask. So that deep focus on the things that we're doing can be one of the first most important things to bringing us peace. Um, So yeah, being in those moments. Um, So then Mark and I had talked about paced breathing. We often will teach our clients who have really high anxiety, what we call square breathing, which is taking segments of four breathing in deeply for four, holding that for four, breathing out for four, and then holding that and kind of going around the square till your anxiety comes down. But research now is telling us that the in-breath is actually the um, enhancing excitement breath. So it makes everything kind of on alert. Where your out-breath is where your body is calming. So paced breathing tells us to take a shorter in-breath and a longer out-breath so that we've got more time in calming. So what we'll do is take a breath in, 
I'll count three, and then we're gonna breathe out, and I will count to about six. Um, if you happen to have asthma, this may not be for you, and there are other exercises we can do. But yeah, so I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, count that, and we'll do that a couple of times. And I would just encourage you as you're breathing to really try not to be thinking about anything. Or if you do think of something, just notice that you thought it. No big deal, no judgment. It's just what we're doing. So we're gonna take a good in breath that gets down to our belly and we're gonna count one, two, three, and we're gonna let that breath out. Two, three, four, five. And then we're going to breathe in, two, three, and we're going to breathe out, two, three, four, five, six. Let's breathe in again, two, three, and an out breath, two, three, four, five, six. And if you just take some time and you do that breathing, three, four minutes, maybe five, it really can just take you to a place of serenity. Um, and that does get you back to a place where you can focus on each issue that's before you in the day in a much more, I guess, just much more relaxed manner. And I think that's when we get our best answers. Mm -hmm. So how was that for everybody practicing the, the deep breathing? Really I've actually, I've actually been doing that. Uh, I tell my kids to do that when they seem a little hyper. Um, but a long time ago, um, a lady taught me that, and I still used it to this day. I think I was like ten years old, and it was a technique that taught me how to relax and um, calm myself down. But I relate to a lot of things you all were saying. I'm not a business owner, but. Lisa was actually hitting a lot of things on the nose that I was explaining to my mother as far as what's going on and living. Uh, don't live in fear because I think fear is like a number one sickness as far as what's going on. Um, yeah. And yeah. just focusing on, I like the max thing. We're putting the max on, not next to the person. Cause I tell my mom that a lot. Worry about, don't worry about me, my brother, my sister, our kids, because we're fine. You have to, especially now, worry about yourself because health is the number one thing. When this happened, I went back to schedule my teeth getting fixed, went for checkups. I did everything because uh, we, we, it's, 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 it's a lot going on right now, but um, I appreciate you guys' conversation. But I just had to say that because I tell my son that probably every single day, stop, breathe, relax, and it makes you feel, feel clear. Mm. Uh, that's that's what I can uh, kind of resemble it as a clear feeling. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. It, and it does. You, and you sharing that with your son, you know, it doesn't matter how old we are, whether your son's age, your age, my age, your mother's age, something that simple can really help us, uh, like you say, clear our minds and just be present in the moment and be able to relax and sit with that for a moment. Um, and there's actually science, you know, behind why that works, you know, that feel good chemical that we're all familiar with serotonin. Um, of course, it is very intricately related to our brain and how our brain communicates. But they've discovered through research that a large majority of serotonin is released from the gut area. And so as Angie was having us do the deep breathing from the diaphragm, you know, there's this release of serotonin throughout the bloodstream that kind of helps us uh, biologically begin to relax as well. Um, so you can see the body interacting with how powerful the mind is. Um, and I know we're, we're getting uh, close to the top of the hour. So we just real briefly, we want to share uh, one, one other uh, technique that we use, which is progressive muscle relaxation. And again, this can be a short, brief um, interaction with your body and your mind as we're going to demonstrate. But then it can also take on a longer like 20 to 30 minute um, time span uh, where you're again connecting the brain with the muscle and how important this is in being able to relax yourself in the moment. So Angie, if you want to walk us through a brief progressive muscle relaxation. relaxation. 
And knowing we're a little short on time, I just have to plug a couple of things. I know the Calm app um, that you can download on your phone can help with some of these things. You can listen to people with these very beautiful, calming voices go through progressive muscle relaxations. There's some good YouTube videos um, and things like that. And I really wanted to thank the gentleman that was speaking because I think one thing that's so important that you said is the fact that you have taught this to your son Mm -hmm. because you know, I talk a lot about constructs and how we construct things in society. And the one way we can change that is to talk to our kids and let them know it doesn't have to be this way. We can have peace. We can have calm. We can have abundance without always being so stressed out. And so I think teaching our children is just one of the most beautiful things that we can do. So progressive muscle relaxation generally starts with deep breathing, which we've already done. So I'll kind of skip past that. But what it then asks you to do is move your attention to different areas of your body. So for instance, you might start by giving attention to your feet and you're going to tighten your feet. You're going to curl your toes. You're going to just really tighten everything. And actually I get Charlie horses in my feet when I do this. So I don't love it, but you're going to hold that for a minute and then let it go. And notice the difference, the difference between that tight, stressed feeling and then letting go and the relaxed feeling. And then we're gonna move up to your calves and we're gonna tense those, tighten those muscles. And as you feel that tension, think about the tension that we have as we go through days without being mindful, without accepting things. And then let's let go of that tension and just feel what that peace and that calm, that relaxation feels like. And you can take your hands and you can ball them into fists, which so often when we're stressed out, we do. We'll notice that our fists get tight and our hands are clenched. And let's just let those go. And you just feel that sensation of letting go, of relaxation. And it becomes incredibly important. One thing that progressive muscle relaxation shows us is that we need to get in tune with our body because we start to recognize, oh, my fists are tight. What's going on? Why am I holding stress? And we're able to then observe those thoughts about why we're holding onto that stress. And we observe them without judgment. And then generally the answers will come. And like I said, I know all of this sounds so counterintuitive, but with practice, it can become such a healing factor in your life. So yeah, if you just continue to, you know, take areas of your body and tense those muscles and then let them go, you can really create a really lovely little ritual for yourself. And you can feel so very relaxed by the end of it. Thank you, Angie. Well, we know we're at the top of the hour, so we wanted to be able to turn it back over to you guys. If you have any questions or comments, we would be happy to continue the discussion. Uh, but again, Angie and I want to thank you so much for allowing us to, um, to share with you today. Um, and, and Rhonda, thank you for connecting us uh, with the community through Primary Health Solutions. Uh, and again, we're just very, very grateful that we had the opportunity to, to share with everyone today. Thank you so much, um, Mark and Angela. That was great. Um, you know, I'm going to be taking some time a couple times a day to do some deep breathing, incorporate that into my day. Um, but we really appreciate you both being here. And thanks, Rhonda, for connecting. Um, Tiffany, Tiffany, you're only saying that because you have to work with me. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think this was very beneficial. And, and you know, we are probably in a time where if you're talking about me being mindful, I think it's more challenging now than ever with you know virus and politics and racial unrest. And it seems like nobody is being mindful or accepting of anybody, anyone else. So it's really kind of a tough, a tough time. So I appreciate this topic. Yeah, well, join us next Tuesday um, at 9 a.m. or sorry, the 20th. Um, uh, at 9 a.m., we'll have uh, your seven-figure business coach um, on, uh, and we'll have a description um, for that event um, this week. So 
uh, join us next week. Thank you guys. And thank you, Primary Health Solutions. Once thank again, you. have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.